this is a symposium on pediatric endocrinology and to deliver the first talk i invite dr vijay sarathi um, for approach to a child and adolescent with undescended testes dr vijay sarathi is a pediatric endocrinologist and he is a professor of department of endocrinology narayan medical college nellore andhra pradesh yeah very good afternoon everyone uh, at the outset i would like to thank the organizers for this great opportunity to address this elegant audience so i'll be speaking on undescended testes an approach to a child birth so undescended testes is one of the most common pediatric genital problem so if you look at the prevalence of undescended testes among preterm infants it is almost 25% because the undescended the de descent of the testes takes around 36 weeks for its completion so as we go down for the term infants the prevalence significantly reduces to around 4% even in the early postnatal life between till around 6 months few more undescended testes will achieve descent reducing the prevalence of undescended testes to 1.5% whereas those who don't achieve descent by 6 months of life usually won't achieve further descent leaving almost 1% of prevalence of undescended testes among adults so before we move on to understand what could be the possible reasons for undescended testes first we need to know what is the normal descent and normal path of testicular descent usually the testes is located in its original abdominal position till around 8 weeks 8 to 10 weeks of gestation after 8 to 10 weeks it descends down through the deep inguinal ring and then through the inguinal canal and then through the uh, superficial inguinal ring and then to the base of the scrotum and this descent is actually divided into two main phases the first phase is the transabdominal phase which includes the descent of testes from its original position till the deep inguinal ring and the further descent as actually we call it as a inguinal scrotal phase where it descends from deep inguinal ring to the base of the scrotum it's important to know these two phases because there is a different mechanisms of regulation of these two phases at around 8 to 10 weeks of gestation the testis is formed and it's in its original position attached superiorly to the diaphragm with the cranio suspensory ligament which is orange in color there and lower down it is attached to the abdominal wall very near to the future inguinal canal with at the rest structure what we call it as gubernacle what happens during the first phase of descent is that there is degeneration of the cranial suspensory ligament and also there is enlargement of the gubernaculum which pulls the testes down towards the super deep inguinal ring with the enlargement of the coelomic cavity and this descent is actually regulated by insl3 that is insulin like factor 3 which is produced by leydig cells but most of it is actually mechanical and there is a small role from amh whereas the further descent through the inguinal inguinal region to the base of the scrotum is actually predominantly mediated by androgens so we can understand if there is an insl3 defect we can expect a transabdominal if it's a androgen defect probably most of the times the testes is descending till the inguinal canal but not descending to the scrotum fine so if, if after understanding this in fact the most complex mechanism along in the descent of testes is actually the descent from the superficial inguinal ring to the base of the scrotum so obviously large number of testes are seen struck at the level of superficial inguinal ring so the prevalence at, of high scrotal testes is almost 60% whereas another 25% are actually struck in the inguinal canal giving a prevalence of around 25% and a smaller proportion of around 15% remain intra abdominal so another important thing while dealing with undescended testes is to differentiate undescended testes that is true undescended testes from the undescended mimics so what are those so one is what we call it as an ascending testes so ascending testes actually has been into the base of the scrotum at some part of life but at present it has ascended back again to call it as undescended testes 
but in fact it's not the true undescended test stage and it should ideally be called as an ascending test stage. Another condition as ectopic test stage, that means the testes is not there descended to the base of the scrotum nor also along the path of normal descent but it has gone to a place which is outside the normal path of testicular descent and that's called as ectopic testis. So, so what are the common positions of ectopic testis? It could be a prepenile, it could be superficial ectopic or it could be transverse scrotal or it could be femoral or perineal. It's very important to know these ectopic locations because when we don't palpate a testis along the normal path, we have to also palpate for these ectopic sites. Another very important condition from which undescended testes should be differentiated is actually retractile testes. So retractile testes is just a testes which is pulled and held at high position by a vore active cremastric reflex. But whenever the child relaxes, so we can notice that the testes has spontaneously descended into the scrotum. Even if it's kept high during an examination, if we use a proper examination, we can manipulate easily into the base of the scrotum. And usually if you maintain it, push it down into the scrotum and maintain the position for one minute, even during the examination, typically the cremastric reflex is overactive. And by doing that manure, we can overcome the cremastric reflex. If you overcome it after the one minute, usually this retractile testis will, dis will stay in the scrotum at least for some time. But usually as the children grow and they reach puberty, the testicular testes enlarge in size and obviously this increase in the size of the testes overcomes the cremastic reflex. So obviously when puberty onwards, all these retractile testes will stay in the scrotum. But another important point what we need to know about retractile testes is that a regular follow, need for regular follow-up because today I know it's a retractile testes, but tomorrow there is a chance for reascent. In some series, it was as high as 50%. So retractile testes also needs to be followed up regular intervals. Very important is to know the method of examination because in fact, it's a technique which is more sensitive even than ultrasound. So, but only it is sensitive when we do a proper examination. So how to do the proper examination for an undescended testes? For example, if you need to examine for the right undescended testes, the examiner needs to stand on the right side, place his left hand just lateral to the deep inguinal ring and then press it down along the inguinal canal till we reach the pubic tubercle. Once we reach the pubic tubercle, then we need to use the right hand and to hold the testes and gently pull it down to the base of the scrotum. So, and once we perform this properly and we can, you know, almost palpate all the undescended testes which are located in the inguinal region and at the base of the scrotum. So coming to etiology, like what are the common causes of undescended testes, which could be anatomical, which include anomalies of the testes, epididymis, vas deferens, or very commonly it could be because of the improper attachment of the gubernaculum, and also associated with patent process of the genalis. In fact, like nearly 90% of the patients with undescended testes will have associated inguinal hernias. Even the anomalies of the inguinal canal can also lead to undescended testes. But probably what is more important to endocrinologists are the hormonal causes. There could be deficient androgen production or even androgen resistance as Wagishar was saying can also lead to undescended testes. Even rarely the deficient AMH production and insensitivity as we see in persistent Muller index syndrome, these patients often have undescended testes. Rarely even deficient insulin-like three factor as well as it resist resistance to it can also lead to undescended testes. So let's take up a case. So a six days old neonate has presented to you and com with a complaint of bilateral undescended testes. On examination, there are no palpable gonads even despite doing a systematic examination. So the question is, which of the following is not a likely diagnosis in this neonate? 46XX congenital adrenal hyperplasia, 46XY hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, 46XY vanishing testis syndrome, 
None of the above. Anybody would like to answer this? Which of the following is not a possibility here? In fact, the answer is none of the above because all of those I have listed could be the possibilities for diagnosis here. So it's not only just 46XY bilateral intra-abdominal testes, which is a DD here, even 46XY vanishing testes syndrome, and also the 46XX congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a very important DD here. It's very, very important to always think this differential and diagnose it because none of us can afford to miss this, miss any opportunity to diagnose 46 excess congenital adrenal hyperplasia because if we don't diagnose them, them in the right time, we'd never know when they will have adrenal crisis and it may be life-threatening as well. Another important condition probably for us endocrinologists is 46 XY hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, which may also present as bilateral undescended testes, often with micropenis, because this is one particular condition probably which may benefit with hormonal therapy, which I'm going to discuss in one of my later slides. So another scenario which we typically come across in undescended testes is unilateral impalpable testes. That means one is palpable, one is not palpable. And there is also associated penile abnormality, which may be typically hyperspadias or really micropenis. Even these group of patients may have some mild disorder of sex development. So it could be a mild 46XY disorder of sex development, which could be mild partial androgen sensitivity, or mild file productase deficiency, or even milder testosterone synthetic defect. Whereas this will also be representing rare cases of mixed gonadal dysgenesis and over testicular DST. And that's the reason even these group of patients should be referred first to endocrinologists and then to urologists. But the large chunk of undescended testes is actually unilateral impalpable testes with no penile abnormality, and no micropenis, no hypospadias. And this is a group of patients who can directly could be referred to urologists. So coming to investigations, though, if you look at the imaging, as I told earlier, the simple examination is much more sensitive than an ultrasound. That's why all recent guidelines have recommended, again, is the routine use of ultrasound in the evaluation of an undescended testis. But however, in patients who are obese, where we are not able to get proper examination, can be subjected for ultrasound. Even the patients with bilateral impalpable testes or unilateral impalpable pineal abnormality, where there could be a possibility of a Mullerian structure or its remnant, we can definitely ask for an ultrasound pelvis to look for Mullerian derivatives. MRI is a very sensitive test, almost 100% sensitivity, but again, it requires general anesthesia, very costly test, so usually, again, not recommended. Look at the labs. Most of it actually should be done by endocrinologist, but just to give a fair idea what probably endocrinologists would do if you refer a child with undescended testes. So whenever there is a bilateral impalpable testes, we would do an ultrasound pelvis to look for uterus, a 17 OHP to rule out CAH, and also karyotype to know whether it's a XX or an XY. And whenever there's an XY, we need to assess the hypothalamo pituitary gonadal axis, which may require testosterone, LH, FSH, AMH, and HCG stimulation. But these tests depend upon the time of evaluation, I mean the age of the evaluation, whether we're evaluating during mini puberty or later. And also we can do it stepwise, and we can decide whether HCG stimulation is required based on the initial step results. Even in the Another scenario of unilateral impalpable testes with penile abnormality, who should be referred to endocrinology? Again, we will have a similar set of investigations except 17-hydroxy progesterone. Looking at the management strategies, we can go for either hormonal therapy or surgery. There are various hormonal regimens, which could be intranasal gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is administered at a dose of 400 microgram thrice a day for four weeks. Whereas HCG, especially for infants, typically is administered as 500 IU per week for five weeks. Some people also use a combination of sequential therapies. And one commonly used sequential therapy is GNRH for four weeks, followed by HCG for three weeks. What is the efficacy of hormonal therapy? So like we're talking as an endocrinologist, as though like hormonal therapy may do good. But in fact, if you look at the results, Hormonal therapy was not a very effective therapy for the management of undescended testes, though it was clearly more effective than the placebo. 
the overall success rate was very dismal. They were only around 20% as the short-term success rate. Long-term success rates are even more compromised because the 20% of those who have descended with hormonal therapy again reascend. And there are also transient side effects such as penile enlargement, pubic hair appearance, erection pain, and injection site pain, which are usually seen only in around less than 1 to 3% of patients. But what is really concerning is the risk of germ cell apoptosis, especially after HCG treatment, and which is typically observed when HCG treatment was given between 1 to 3 years of age. And in fact, this is actually a strong reason why the urologists are discouraging the use of hormonal therapy. And if you look at another place for the role of hormonal therapy is neoadjuvant gonadotropin releasing hormone therapy before the archetopexy, which has actually been shown to improve the fertility index in two studies. But however, we don't know whether this improving fertility index will turn into a future adult fertility potential. If you look at the position statements on the use of hormonal therapy by usually most of these position statements are given by surgeons, especially the American Urology Association completely recommends against the hormonal therapy, but European guidelines are a little bit considering GNRH therapy as a neoadjuvant therapy, at least for those patients who have bilateral undescended testes to improve the fertility potential. But if at all, if you consider probably these hormonal therapies should be given before 12 months of age, not after 12 months. Very interesting study published just this month in Journal of Endocrine Society is actually the REMAP study. That's replacement of male mini puberty. What they did here is that they selected infants with bilateral cryptorchidism, whether intra-abdominal or inguinal, and had micropenis, and they lacked absence of neonatal male mini puberty. That means they're all patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. When they mimicked mini puberty by giving injections of LH and FSH, LH of 75 and FSH of 150 with a daily injection, but they achieved a much higher levels than what we achieve in mini puberty. But there were very good results. Inhibin B increased significantly, AMH increased significantly, testo increased significantly, even the testicular volume as well as stretch penile length increased. But more interesting for today's talk is, it's not only these biochemical changes, but there are also all testes descended to the scrotum, and most of them remain in the scrotum even after eight to 10 years of follow-up. That probably at least in patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, these hormonal therapies are going to be very helpful in the management of undescended testes, and that's the reason why these kids should be identified whether they have hypohypo or not. But coming to the surgical rates, as I told earlier, when compared to hormonal therapy, surgery has a very high success rate, not only short term, also long term. That's the reason why surgery has been preferred as the first line of treatment. But next debate is when to do surgery? What is the ideal timing of surgery? To know this, we first need to know what are the complications of surgery and its relation to aged archaeopexy. So very nice study published in NHGM way back in 2007 clearly told that there is no f much increase in the risk of testicular cancer during the initial 10 to 12 years of archaeopexy. But when archaeopexy was done after 13 years of age, there was a significant increase in the risk of germ cell cancer. So it was concluded that to reduce the risk of germ cell cancers, even if you do archaeopexy anytime before 12 years, should be fine. But we're all recommending the procedure by around 12 to 18 months. Why are we doing that? If there's not increase in testicular cancer risk, why are we recommending surgery between 12 to 18 months? This is basically because of preservation of the fertility potential. It has been documented that even as early as 12 to 18 months, there is a decrease or even in very few patients in the lack of germ cells unless archaeopexy has been done. Even there are studies documenting that those who underwent archaeopexy between 12 to 24 months had lesser fertility potential as an adult when compared to those who underwent archaeopexy before 12 months of age. That means there is a clear indication that all these archaeopexy patients, especially bilaterally undescended ones, should be operated or should undergo archaeopexy before 12 months of age. I think I'll skip this because lack of time. Just to summarize, whenever we have an undescended testes, first thing is to rule out retractile testes. And then you see 
any indication to refer to endocrinologists, whether they have any obvious ambiguous genitalia, whether they have bilateral impalpable testes, or even when they have unilateral, bilat unilateral descended, undescended testes, whether they have any penile abnormalities such as hyperspadias or micropenis. If any one of these are present, please refer them first to endocrinologist. If none of these are there, that means there's only unilateral undescended testes without any penile abnormality, then you see whether the child is more than six months or less than six months. If more than six months, already you have waited enough, please send the urologist to, please send the patient to a pediatric surgeon or an urologist who is well versed with archaeopexy. If it's less than six months, don't hurry up to refer, wait till six months. Even after six months, there is no descent, then you can refer to the surgeon. So a few more take home messages, differentiate retractile testes from undescended testes. Spontaneous descent may occur even up to six months of life. Routine ultrasound to localize testes is not recommended. Hormonal therapy is less effective, but definitely useful for bilateral undescended testes, lacking muni pivoti, that is hypogonotropic hypogonadism. Archaeopexy has high success rates, and but should be done between six to 18 months of age. Thank you.